Okay, so um, uh, last module for me, module five, uh, variant coding, but this time structural variant coding. Um, so what uh, I hope we will learn today is to understand what are structural variants, um, to understand how we discover, we try to find SG uh, in SGS data, so in next, gener next generations within data, and how difficult it is. Uh, so there's no perfect method to do, so there's many approach to do that, and I hope you will understand what are the strengths and the, and the weakness of each of the strategy I will present. And then at the end, uh, we will look quite uh, rapidly to uh, the structural variant signal uh, in IGV or in your read. And uh, at the, for, on the practical, we will call some SV and explore some SV um, in your data. So what are we uh, calling structural variant? So usually, it's a real, it's a, it's a, there's no clear definition, but uh, there's an accepted definition, which, is, which means that structural variants are genomic rearrangement that affect a larger part of your uh, sequence. So a more than, usually more than 50 base pair, but sometimes it's 20, depending on the criteria. So for people, it's 100 base pair, some other is 1 kb. And it includes deletion, insertion, inversion of sequence, mobile elements, uh, duplication, translocation. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, many years ago, before we were in the NGS uh, area, calling uh, structural variants what was done like that. So you can imagine we are looking at bond, karyotype, or fish. So you can imagine how complicated it was. Uh, this is an example. It was working, for example, in cancer. It was an example of what can be found in terms of um, uh, structural variant um, understanding we have before uh, as the NGS area. So I talk about SVs. So SVs are different class of SVs. Um, so there's the copy number uh, variant, which has a deletion and duplication, which we call CNV, that usually are um, that are large deletion and large duplication, that are that are uh, usually treated as a separate signal. There are the copy uh, neutral rearrangement, inversion, translocation, and the other type of variant. So there's three more class. And if we talk about structural variant, uh, what is important to do is when we talk about structural variant, we talk about what we observe in the sample compared to what is in the reference. Okay? Because in your samples, you don't have a variant if you compare your sample to your sample. It's what we observe in your sample compared to the reference. Okay? When we talk about deletion, we mean that in the sample, we have found that this sequence from the reference has disappeared. But there's no deletion physically in, the, in, your, in your sample if you compare to him. It's its own sequence. OK, so keep in mind that it's always based on what reference you use to call a structural variant. And based on it will impact on how you observe the data and how, what, what looks the signal. So a deletion could look like reads that are really large, which uh, initially people would say, no, that seems that there's a piece, in, there's more data in it. No, it's large because they have loose. And we, you look at the signal from the sample in the reference. So you need to, re, to revert back from reference to sample to really understand uh, what the SV signal will be. OK, so we have the different signal. Deletion, insertion, mobile element insertion, tandem duplication, inspired duplication, inversion, and translocation. OK, so 
just to come back, so starting around the time we are doing uh, karyotyping, fish, then people start to look at CNV using uh, CGHUH array or a SNP array, and now we are at the area of uh, high throughput DNA sequencing. Uh, just to give you an idea of how we call, how, what impact on CNV, when we are doing working with uh, uh, CGH, we only have information about uh, amount of DNA per region, and while we go and with advanced technology, we are able to bring the same information, but to add additional information to give us uh, more um, a clever way to, to look at the variant. For example, if you look here between the different copy, it was complicated to, to find a, a copy, a different copy, but with the different signal of the uh, allelic ratio, it's more easier to make the difference between the copy. Same thing for deletion or mosaic loss. You see it's not, it's not the same signal, so you have more information. Well, you, you have more, uh, 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 you have a, a stronger signal and stronger um, calls when you bring more information. So theoretically, in, S, in uh, NGS data, you are able to call almost every type of uh, structural variant, depending of what method you are using. So your point mutation, your indels, deletion, uh, translocation, everything should be doable. To do that in NGS data, we use dif different strategies. So there are four strategies that are used that I will give you more detail uh, after that. Um, read pair, read depth, split read, and assembly. So read pair. What's the rationale being behind doing a read pair approach? So when you do read pair, you want to identify the breakpoint so where is located your uh, structural variant by looking at how reads are aligned. So when you sequence a library, you know the shearing that have been uh, made, so you know which insert size is expected in your data, and you know, depending on which type of library, the orientation of your reads. So the read paired uh, method, try to look if you see discordant paired, so paired that are discordant, uh, so a normal insert size or a normal orientation. And you try to look cluster of evidence at the same region or the same signal of discordant paired. What that means, so we have the insert size distribution. So it's why it's important to have a tight distribution around your, your, your mean. You want the, less, uh, the lower uh, standard deviation because you will say, okay, this is my mean, I've got my standard deviation, everything that is more than whatever standard deviation, one, two, three, depending on what um, accuracy you want, and would be called as a discordant in terms of insert size. Then you've got your insert size, you also have your reads. Uh, if your reads are in the same direction or in another direction, you will say, okay, if I have a change in my orientation, it will be also a discordant uh, um, approach. Now, what that means in terms of Signal to detect. So if I have a concordant uh, data, uh, we can see we have an insert size that is correct, and we have an orientation uh, reverse forward of the read. Now if I have a deletion, so if I lose, so this is the, in top, this is the sample, in bottom, this is the reference genome. So if I have a deletion, if I lose part of my reference in my sample, as my fragment come from my sample, they don't have this, this fragment are from normal size in the sample, but when I will map back this fragment, I will have correct orientation, but a really large insertion, depending on the size of the, the pieces of the reference genomes that have been missed. Same thing, if I look at an insertion, it will be the opposite, so I will have in my sample fragment of the correct size, and I will, when I will map back to the reference, the two reads will map uh, really closely. So it's why it's important here to have a, a, a small standard deviation to be able to have, a, to have a resolution, especially for insertion. If you have too large standard deviation, two standard deviation will be more than your reads or your insert size, and 
you won't be able to catch uh, insertion. Yes. Um, how would you go about detecting an insertion larger than what your read character span? You will not do it with uh, with read character. Right. You will use uh, other uh, approach. If you are looking at tandem duplication, what you will see, so you have one fragment, so if you have a tandem duplication, you have the two fragments side to side, and you have the two extremity of your repeated fragment that will appear in your uh, reference to be as opposite and large uh, in size, size, depending on the size of the, of the fragment. So here you will have the uh, inverse orientation with, depending on the size, possibly change in the in the inter side. For an uh, inversion, you will have a signal like that where one is normal, the other is in the same direction but with a really large inter size, and you will have the opposite breakpoint that will pop up at the same and you will see the two the two signals. For the tandem, sorry, yeah. why the why the directionality is opposite? You just you just increase your so you, you, you will have some read that will be in the weak point. So the, this one will be, the read that span here will be here with orientation, the read that span here will be with orientation, but the, the one that are spanned around the uh, location of the breakpoint where you kick it. So this read, as you have a double copy, will arrive at the same position, but oh, well, only one okay. copy. And this one will be there. So. Instead of having two bits there, it will be at the opposite direction. Okay. Um, if you have uh, insertion from long distance, you will have the same kind of signal, but could be on other uh, problem or really large on, the, on your on your genes. So here are a non-exhaustive list of. Uh, repair tools you can use to, to detect your your, your, your um, structural variants, and there are many new ones, and every year a new one uh, appears. Uh, before we move to the next one, I just give you a kind of uh, an overview. This is uh, some um, a summary of different projects uh, where the different structural variations have been um, um, called by a repair approach, and what you can see is there's a kind of bias in what type of events would be called. Majority repair will call deletion. It's better for, for deletion. For the other, it's more complicated. Another comment on repair is that repair is, is good for simple events, but at the moment you start to have complex genomic rearrangement in the region, the signal starts to become completely crazy and you cannot make sense of what you, what you are. So what are the strengths and weakness of this approach? So the weakness is difficult to interpret read pair in complex region, in repeated region, because there will be a lot of uh, noise and a lot of events. Uh, it's difficult to characterize early um, around region, and you have a lot of um, high false positive when you do read pair, so you will have a lot of calls. Uh, and also, you have uh, some issue with some uh, some calls that are not being called. Like insertion are really difficult to, to call with a repair. The strength is that, theoretically, it can call everything. So as I said, it's not fully true, because insertion, if you, at the moment, you're, you're uh, standard deletion is a bit too high, you will not be able to detect your insertion. The second method is the split read. So the rationale behind... Yes? Uh, question before you go on. Um, the tools that you mentioned, yeah. are those mainly used in repair tools or are they mainly used Uh, no, there's no difference. It's more depending on what type of sequencing you have. This is 
uh, tools that are more um, uh, focused on short read sequencing. As we were discussing yesterday, if I have to do some project with, uh, for example, bacteria, I will go with longer reads, do some assemblies, and call my structural variant with other tools, but because I use a different approach for sequencing. So this is the one that are based for, and all, all this presentation shows the, the, the data that are based for short read sequencing. So depending on what you are doing, or the specificity of your organism, uh, it, will, it could change what strategy of sequencing you will use, and that case it will change the tool you will use. But if you use short read, this one uh, should be but I say it's a non-exhaustive, so yeah. uh, that probably could have if, there, if you if you have like problem with uh, autotypes or fluidity, uh, sorry, you could change things, so you could look for specific uh, tools to take that into account. Split read. The rationale between split read is um, when we look at the reads. You have, the, the, you have the, the event, and you have so the insertion, the pair that we use in the read pair, but you expect to have a certain quantity of reads that really fall at the breakpoint. And the speed read approach try to use uh, this uh, set of reads. So the, the reads that have a fall directly on the breakpoint should, strong, uh, should show a signal where part of the read should map at one specific location, the other should map another uh, location. Uh, so we'll discuss that at the end of the, of the speed read section. But uh, you have the disadvantage that you need to have reads that fall directly on the breakpoint. So probably you will have less reads than if you look at the signal with uh, the, the read pair. And if you are able to have longer reads, it's better because you have more chance and to observe uh, reads and, uh, that are covering the back front. So what you have, you do your, your read, you align, and most of your pair will be aligned correctly to the reference genome, but you will have some pair that will be either align one read align, the other won't, won't align, or the second read will just align one fraction of the read and the other fraction will not align. So you will focus on this kind of um, um, uh, one mapped reads, and you will try to get the signal of the, of the split read. So how it works? So here in the in the top, it's a, it's a read pair signal. So if you have a deletion, this is your reference, this is your donor. You expect to see on your reference larger insert size or smaller insert size. In terms of split read, what you expect? You expect reads that cover the region like that in your donor will be split in one pieces one side of the of the event, the other at the other side. Same thing for the insertion. As, a, as the same problem as previously, if the insertion is too high, it will cover the uh, it will cover the length of, it will go over the length of the read, and you will only see one region that will map, and you will have to try to make sense of that. In terms of uh, inversion. You will have reads that map here, and you will have reads that map inverted at the other orientation. Same for the two signals. So as I say, having reads that cover a region is really good because it helps you to have really the exact breakpoint. The signal is really uh, clear. But the thing is that you usually don't have enough reads to do it. So if you want to do it alone, uh, you need to lower your, um, your uh, the number of evidence to generate that signal, and you will you really have a lot of false positives. So uh, what is done now? It's now most of the method will use both read pair and speech read at the same time. It's a really good combination. So because a lot of split read, a lot of uh, read pair will be used to really go and do a first pass to look at the data, and then the speed read will come to try to uh, map the breakpoint and to confirm uh, what has been seen. And it could be good because it also allows to uh, detect small deletion that read pairs uh, cannot detect because it over the standard deletion and the precision of the, of the method. 
And this is a tool, not, as I say, non-exhaustive uh, list. And what you can see is some tools that we have some seen in the repair uh, list are also in the speech read, like Delhi and Numpy. So the tool Delhi we will use during the practical. And uh, this is because tools that use both approach together. If you're looking to reinforce a split read, the best thing to do would be to have greater depth of coverage. Yeah. All long read. Sorry? Longer read. Long read. Because longer read, you will have more read that cover the same data. And you will have also more more, um, more chance to catch larger events, for example, larger insertion. So what are the weakness and the strengths of uh, the method? So the strength is that it really works well in addition with read pair method. It's how you use the best pair resolution of your breakpoints that you won't be able to do with read pair. And it can detect very short events. Um, weakness, you need more coverage, and have a lot of false positives if it's used alone. Next method is read depth. So read depth uh, is mainly used to detect uh, copy uh, number variation. So it's a really, really good approach. But one thing, it has a main assumption at the beginning. It has, the assumption is it assumes that you have an homogeneous distribution of your read, so that you have an homogeneous coverage all along your genomes. We discuss and I discuss that with GC content. This is not true. With mappability, this is not true. So that's the main issue that we, that we need to face. How it works, the main read depth approach is you divide your genomes into bin of equal size. Then you estimate the depth of coverage in each bin. And then you look for a cluster or consecutive bin that show deviation in your coverage. So the, 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 the principle is really easy and simple. The main issue is that this main assumption. So theoretically, how it, it works, so if you have deletion of duplication, if you have deletion, you will see your coverage, and then you will see a lot of bins that drop coverage, because you don't have means you don't have DNA from that. If you have a duplication, all the copy of the, co of the copy of your, of your region will map to the same region, and you will have a bump of coverage. So really, it's simple. And what is interesting is that this uh, strategy uh, is a kind of um, the child of what had been developed with CGHRA at the beginning. So all the methodology has been there because CGHRA works the same, on the same principle. You count on your how many uh, amount of DNA you see on a regular basis. So all the methodology, uh, statistical approach has been already developed. So this is an example of what you expect to see. Uh, so this is the signal is clearly, if you look at the coverage, you clearly see a big signal and you can clearly see so when it works well, in germline sample, it works super well. In tumor, which, it, which is more important, then we start to have issues. Um, this is an example of what we saw in tumor, when you, when you have good tumor. Uh, this is a visualization of uh, one, a tool uh, that we develop uh, at our center, which is called SCONE, where you have your normal, uh, normal uh, coverage, your tumor coverage, and the ratio of the two, and you are able to detect which are region which have copy number in your uh, in somatic copy number. So when the signal is there, when the, there's, there's no real noise, it's super easy to do, depending on which resolution. When you start to go with small resolution, you start to have higher impact with the noise and the local variation of your uh, coverage. So what's the main issue with this method is the normalization. As we say, the main assumption is that all your bin, so what you expect, your expectation is that all my bin have the same coverage, approximately. And when I have, for example, a duplication, I will see that. So if the signal is like what we expect, like that, super easy, as we see here, super easy to detect. Now, in reality, is that what we observed? The signal is really noisy, and we have this deletion. Making, knowing that this one is different from this one, particularly, is super difficult. 
Why is this super difficult? Because almost, almost all the tools, and the tool I, I design, I develop, this is the one we, we use there, works that way. We do normalization like that. We normalization with all the beam around you. So there's new methods, and one where really, if you have enough sample, uh, I recommended you to, to, to use, when it's called PopSV. Uh, it's a copy number variation uh, method, where the idea is to take, to work in population. If you have enough sample, what you will do, instead of doing your normalization like that, you will imagine that you have your, this is your real sample, you have other real sample, Stack all together, you will normalize vertically. So you will take your beans at this region of the genomes, and you will look in every sample what is the common variation of coverage in that bean. And if you have a deletion in one specific sample, this should vary. It should be different from the other uh, sample. So whatever the other coverage, whatever the other bean, is there is they are affected by local variation, you don't care because you will measure only that bin and the variation in that bin. And I have to say, me, I've developed this tool, which is called SCON. This student have developed PopSV, and if you have enough sample, it kicks out whatever method you will, you will do. How many samples do you need for that? So that's the main question. I always ask him, and it depends on the COVID, on the, on the homogeneous. It's starting to, to work. So it, 30 is the safest number. If you have 30 samples, it will, it will, it will always work. If you have a really good sample, really good quality, 15, 10, 15 could be, could be used. But to be safe, you always say 30. So how it works is like that. So for each bin, you will do the local variation in the population, local variation, and plot the variation of your individual sample compared to the population. And then if you have an event, it will show that your local variation is different from what you expect in the, in the population. And it has a really good impact to go and low mappability region, small precision. It works really well if you have enough sample. So it's perfect. So this is the list of tools. There's many, 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 many tools you can use. And also all the CGSRI tools can be applied. So what are the uh, weakness and strengths of this approach? Uh, the strengths, fast, simple, easy to interpret. You see some graphs that tell you it's easy. You see the relation. Um, it determines the copy number, uh, so it, give you, it could give you a genotype. And with the population approach, you are uh, poor, powerful to use that with low coverage or with, um, or with really low resolution. Um, weakness, uh, if you don't use population, you have a resolution which starts to be uh, a bit high, between 5 to 10 KB for the smallest event. Sometimes you want to, to go lower. Um, you know, the breakpoint are ambiguous because it depends on the size of your beans. So some methods now use sliding beans to try to get more uh, better uh, resolution of the breakpoint, but it's still uh, complicated. So when you have find your events going with other methods to like split read to find your real breakpoint is, is a better. And it, you cannot find uh, balanced uh, rearrangement. So things that compounds the, the copy uh, number. It also applies to DNA only, right? We use it for RNA. But the depth sequence is. Yeah. So, what we do, we, right? we increase the resolution. We take, so we, when we apply it for RNA, we take a resolution really large, so we cannot go with really uh, low resolution uh, mapping, but we, we take beams that are so large that the individual expression of each gene will not affect the total number of counts in the beam. So, it works, but it's to make it work, you need to really get a uh, sufficient amount of, so we take, we count in each exome. So we need to have sufficient uh, exome that one gene, one expression of a gene will not uh, bias the full gene. And we are able to do that in, a, in also in single cell. Single cell every day, we are able to do that. Or so it, it works really well. Um, in terms, the last, the last approach, is the assembly approach. Uh, the rationale of the assembly is what you are doing. Uh, you say, OK, uh, one of the main problems of uh, the S all the SV methods is that I'm using a reference. And I need to go back to the reference and then back to my sample. And that makes 
any problem with all the mapping, quality, distribution, all these all this, um, technicalities that make me things difficult. So the idea is to say, OK, forgot about the reference. Take my read. I'm doing a de novo assembly. I generate long contigs, long straight of, of segment. And when I've got generate my contigs, I can go back, map this contig to the reference, and then uh, have better <coughs> Uh, vision of the of the structural uh, variant. <coughs> uh, so, why is it working? Because when you do assembly, except for some region where it's complicated to do the assembly, your contig will be way more larger than what you have in terms of reads. So your resolution, everything will be um, will will be uh, easier to detect your, your structural variant. Um, the contigs are created based on the uh, common uh, sequence from different reads, so you have several approaches. So it really works well to do it. And there's two different approaches in, um, in this rationale. is to do world genome assembly or local assembly. Um, world genome assembly usually should be the best one. But as we already say, when you do a choice, there's a cost. World genome assembly is resource, uh, it costs a lot of resource to do, so, and a lot of time. So if you have time, resource, compute resource to do it, you can go with that, but it's, it's really a um, uh, um, resource intensive task. So when you do the genome assembly, it's exactly what I did. You do your de novo assembly of your world genome, then you take your contig, you align your contigs on your, on your scaffold, you group your scaffold, and you look how it arranged on your genomes. <coughs> And uh, when you see some, scaf some scaffold that contain it on different region or separate region, you could probably have insertion or deletion event or, or <laughs> other event. So it, it really works well. It's a lot of work to do the assembly, a lot of work to make sense of the data. But uh, I, I think that's the best way, if you have resource and time to do it, that's the, that the best way to, to, to detect uh, complex structural variants. Uh, the local de novo assembly try to reduce the time and, uh, and the resource to do that. What, what they do when you have event, specific event uh, around uh, your structural variant, what you, will, uh, what you will have, you will have some reads that either don't map to the genome because of the structural variant, or reads that we called uh, one end on the red, uh, on red, which have one, one end that are mapped in the genome, the other are unmapped. So they take all these reads and do local assemblies of regions where we have a map and one end on red reads. Then we generate the contigs, and we map back the contig to the genome to use that. And we are able to use the, the one end on red read as anchor to know where the, the data, uh, the structural variant, will be located. So it's, to my point of view, it's work a bit. Uh, a, a talk, it works well, but not as well as what we have with full de novo assembly. So uh, you can see the, the different signature you will have in a, in a local assembly. So what is cool is that it's able to detect almost every um, every uh, type of um, SV, except like what is the, the weakness of type of assembly is for um, uh, duplication. Duplication sometimes is hard because repeated region at the border of the repeated region it's what make um, assembly um, uh, uh, algorithm fail. What are the different tools? Uh, so all the assembler uh, that could be used: uh, Cortex, SGA, Abyss, SOAP, whatever. And there's these tools uh, which do local one, which is called Vaba, that we use for doing local uh, local assembly detection of uh, structural variants. Um, the weakness, very, very intensive in terms of, of uh, resources, and it's hard to resolve sometimes region on the, on the genome. Uh, strength, really a good resolution of reads, uh, of your breakpoint, and almost all variation could be detected. So just to give you a summary of the different methods, so you've got, you're going to from death of coverage to assembly. And you can see this is the resolution that you can get with each method. First line. So you can see that 
you could have lower resolution with method, but it's really easy to do. So it's time, as I said, it's a choice. I want to have to take this method, but I will have low resolution, but it will be easy to do and fast. I want to have high resolution, it will be complicated to work. So it will pass me more resources, more times, and, and so on. Uh, so in summary, we have seen there are four these four different methods that can that you can use. Each one has their uh, strength and weakness. Uh, so as I say, no recent tool use a uh, combination of different methods. Uh, Delhi and Lumpy are the first one that did that. Now there are other tools that do that. Do that. Um, and during the practical, we will use Delhi to do the analysis. Uh, what is the major challenge when you do um, the structural, vari structural variant detection is to deal with complex events that we saw this complex region. The tools will give you a lot of signals and noisy signals. It's to find the real breakpoints. So this is a two computational challenge. And then the third challenge, which is more a lab challenge, is then to do validation. As we say, as for variant, when we do calling, it's prediction. We want to validate the data. Validating large event, it's quite complicated to do. Uh, so you can either take long reads or you can try to do long range PCR, but it's not working out super well. So validation of uh, SV uh, is complicated. It's why we, the, the field is still evolving so much and there's still new method because no one was able to generate a real true set, validated true set of, of uh, structural variants that we can use to benchmark methods. So it's why everybody proposes method, do simulation, do blah, blah, blah. But there's no one true set. OK, we know this one. All the structural variant has that, that, that. Run the tools, and we know which are the false positives. As we have for SNP, it's not possible for structural variant now. Just a, qu a quick um, slide on uh, visualization. So uh, you already seen that uh, yesterday. Uh, when you see deletion, you expect to see like that. So read that map with insert size around the, de the, the deletion. Uh, tandem duplication, you expect read in the two directions, that map, that, like that. Uh, an inversion, so you've got your two set of reads there and there, that are opposite direction. Insertion in the reference. And just to, to show now, when people try to display structural variants, this is the way people try to, to show that. So I don't know if you, if you already saw the, that kind of graph. It's a way to show a circular, so it's called circle <laughs> plot. It's a way to show in the top the different location of your variation, and here the location of the translocation. This is how people do that. And that's it. I think it's lunch time. No, not lab time. Any question? So circle plot is a um, circularization. So each here you have it start here. You have chromosome one, two, three, four, uh, so on until chromosome uh, X and Y here. So this is a circular represent a circular representation of your genomes, and then you have tracks that show. For example, at this point, I've got uh, an event. Could be copy number. Could be um, uh, whatever event, so you, you plot your event, and in the middle, you it's a way to plot a translocation because it's complicated to plot link between two chromosomes. So it's just how it's used usually to, to plot structural va variants. So you've got the, the circular genomes, you've got different tracks, circular tracks that show um, um, not it could be also point mutation, but local event, and then in the middle you have links that show a translocation between the region. So how many translocations are there? Uh, I, I don't know if it's a, a, a real uh, circle plot of genomic because it's used for, uh, but if you want at the break I can show you a, a circle plot of a real event. And circles, if you want to do circle plot, you can use circles, the website, 
but it's super complicated to work, not super complicated, but it's complicated to work, and it asks you to have a good notion of, uh, of um, format and, bio and, uh, and data manipulation, because the format is a kind of embedded format. So if you want to do it uh, more easily, there's a lot of package in, in R you can use to do, to do that, if you, if you are um, used to, familiar with R uh, statistical language. It says, like, circleize, the package circleize, do the, do the job really well. There's also a website, I don't know if you know this one, it's called Circus, okay? Yeah. They made Circos and made it like an But if you have only uh, X only data to work with? It's more complicated. <laughs> uh, usually, we can, there are some method, like um, some CNV method, and especially the PropSV population approach will be able to, to go for uh, exam, CNV in exam, because you're looking at each bin, uh, so it would be the same. At the moment, you have the same kit and same bits. But the problem is that when you do exam, it's a question of you have your region and it's captured by bits. So the, the number of bits is not uniform and it creates artifacts in terms of the, of the signal of the pair or of the strand. So all these methods do not apply really well on, um, on exam, unfortunately. Mm -hmm.